All right, so today is Unit 1 Kinematics, Lesson 6, Acceleration Due to Gravity. Okay, and I think we're used to acceleration due to gravity from grade 11. Um, I'm hoping everyone remembers no matter what an object's mass is, it's going to accelerate down to the Earth at an acceleration of 9.81 meters per second squared down. Very, very important, this is not a constant. I know in grade 11 we use it all the time but it is a variable because it de changes depending on where you are right if you were to climb to the top of mount everest it would be slightly less than that okay if you're on the international space station again slightly less than that and i only say slightly because it's very important um, even though the astronauts are floating on the international space station there is still gravity okay? and that comes from uh, Newton's cannon, right? So Newton's thought of this extremely large cannon, right? And if you were to shoot this cannon and there was no gravity, well, you can imagine what would happen. The bullet would just go straight forever. But because there's gravity, it pulls it down to the earth. However, if you can shoot it faster and faster, the faster you throw it, the further it's able to travel before it hits the ground until you reach a point where it's traveling so fast that even though it's falling, it never actually gets closer to the ground, so it never falls it down. And that's why astronauts on the International Space Station are floating, it's because they're actually falling. And the space station they're in is falling, but they're moving at such a high horizontal velocity, they never actually fall down. But remember, there's still gravity there. Because if there was no gravity, that space station would go off and never come back. Okay, just like there's gravity that pulls the moon into orbit. Okay, and of course the value of the acceleration will be different. Right, on the moon, um, just off the top of my head, I think it's about one sixth of that. On Mars, I think it's about one third of that. Right, on the International Space Station, I think it's around eight point six, eight point seven. Because right? the International Space Station is only, I'm just kidding, I can't remember these numbers, maybe around 400 kilometers up. Right? And that's it. Okay, so it's actually not that quite far away. But let's get back to Earth here. The acceleration of gravity on Earth is 9.81 meters per second squared, and that goes for any object. Of course, there is air resistance. Right, so if I were to drop a textbook compared to a feather, obviously the textbook is going to hit the ground first. That's because um, there's air resistance, right? Because uh, air resistance provides an upwards force, right? However, if there was no air and you were to drop that textbook and feather on the moon, like they did in one of the Apollo missions where they dropped on a hammer and a falcon feather, they fell at the exact same rate and hit the ground at the same time. You can look up a video like that on YouTube or maybe I'll post it as well. Okay, so everything falls at the same rate. Now let's go back and talk about air resistance. Okay, if there is air resistance, right, that sort of slows down your descent. And the faster you're going, the more air resistance there'll be. You can imagine sort of don't do this, but you can imagine sticking your hand out of a, a vehicle when it's driving at 40 compared to at 100. Right? When you're driving at 100, there's a lot more air pushing against your hand, a lot more force. And so when something falls, let's do a quick free body diagram, which you know, we'll get more into that next chapter. But you'll have the force of gravity down, and you'll have a little bit of air resistance up. And then as it um, falls faster and faster and faster because it's accelerating, that air resistance is going to get greater and greater and greater until that force of air resistance is equal and opposite to gravity and suddenly it doesn't accelerate anymore. It reaches a maximum velocity which we call terminal velocity. And some things reach terminal velocity extremely quickly. Look at cockroach. Cockroach is extremely light but has a very large surface area. And so if you were to toss a cockroach off the CN Tower, 
it actually wouldn't reach a very high speed. It would reach terminal velocity very quickly, and it would fall nicely to the ground like a parachute, and then it would walk away. Okay. Um, what else did I want to mention? Free fall. So free fall is a term we use um, when the only force acting on you is gravity. Like um, the astronauts on the International Space Station. In that case, there is no air resistance because they're in orbit, they're in space, they're above the atmosphere. And so they we say they're in constant free fall. All right, so let's try some problems. On the back, we have two problems. The first problem is going to be sort of a review of grade 11. And the second problem is going to be a little bit more challenging. It's like a grade 12 question. So let's go over the first one. First one says, in a laboratory experiment, a computer determines that the time for a falling steel ball to travel the final 0.8 meters before hitting the floor is 0 0.087 seconds. With what velocity does the ball hit the floor? All right, what do we know? We know we fall how far? 0.8 meters. So we know the displacement is 0 0.80 meters, and it's a vector, so down. What else do we know? They give us time. 0 0.087 seconds. What else? Okay, I know a lot of people in this question, I get a lot of students saying, oh, the initial velocity is zero. Now, it is true if you were to take something and drop it, the initial velocity would be zero. But in this question, it doesn't say something is dropped. It says it takes 0 0.08 seconds, 7 seconds to travel the final 0.8 meters, meaning it was moving before then, or it was falling before then. So we can't assume initial velocity is zero. But since we're on Earth, and you can't assume it's on Earth unless I say otherwise, we can say the acceleration is 9.81 meters per second squared down. Now, since everything, all our vectors are down, it's going to be easier if I just say, let's make our down direction a positive direction. And now we need an equation that does not have initial velocity in it. And then we can solve for final velocity. So our equation is going to be this one. If you look at your five equations for motion, final delta t minus a half a delta t squared. All right, so we just need to rearrange this and solve for final velocity. So bring this term to the other side. So that negative will become a positive. And I can divide every term by delta t. And we get our final velocity equal to so our displacement over time. Those will cancel. Plus a half a delta t. We can plug in everything we know, and we'll get final velocity equal to 9.6 meters per second. And since we made our positive direction down, that's down. Okay, so. Everyone hopefully is okay with that. Let's move on to the second question. Now, the second question I've made a second video, which is sort of an animated, like, um, animated whiteboard video. So in this video, what I want to do is sort of help you set up the problem, and then I want you to take it from there and try to solve it. If you get stuck, watch the other video. But in grade 12, we're really going to work on your problem solving skills. In grade 11, a lot of it was learning new concepts that you've never learned before. And so a lot of the problems that we did is problems that I call plug and play problems, right? And you use a strategy, which I call the hunter and gatherer strategy. It's a great way to start when you're first doing physics, but it's not the, the type of problem solving skill that you want to rely on. So what do I mean by hunter and gatherer? And I know a lot of you do this. You gather all your information in a question, which is good. You should break down all your given information. But then the bad thing is you look at your equation sheet and you hunt for which one works. This isn't good. I don't want you to hunt for which equation works like a puzzle piece. I want you to understand each equation. 
I want you to know which ones are going to apply to which real world situations. Okay, because in grade 12, there's going to be multiple equations which will seem to work because they have all the variables you want, but apply to different situations. And so it's very easy to suddenly plug everything in the one equation and get zero on the whole question. Because okay, you might, I see students, for example, use an acceleration equation for something that's not accelerating. And just because it looks like all the variables they have they're given right and also in grade 12 something that we do is we have problems that require two equations with two unknowns or three equations with three unknowns so you end up having to solve a system of equations and if you're simply relying on looking for which equation is going to work you're not going to find one because there's not going to be one that works for you but if you know which equations apply to the situation and how the, to use them and what they mean, then you'll be able to pick out those equations and solve the system. And this example that I'm going to set you up is a perfect example for how that's going to look like. And I'm going to teach you some new problem solving strategies. So let's look at this question. This question says a flower pot is dropped from the balcony of an apartment 28.5 meters above the ground. At a time of one second after the pot is dropped, a ball is thrown vertically downward from the balcony one story below 26 meters above the ground. The initial velocity of the ball is 12 meters per second down. Does the ball pass the flower pot before striking the ground? If so, how far above the ground are the two objects when the ball passes the flower pot? Okay, so we've read through the question. Now the best thing to do, a great problem solving strategy, is not just to write your given information, which we do in grade 11, but to write it on a picture so that we can visualize what is exactly happening here. So let's do that. So, so we have a building and there's the ground. In the building here, we have a flower pot. Okay, and it is 28.5 meters from the ground. Then at time of one second later, a ball is thrown vertically. So I'm going to put this over here so I don't have too much information in one spot. Take a ball and we throw it down vertically. Now this is 26 meters above the ground. All right, so let's continue. can't remember where I left off, but see, the ball's 26 meters from the ground, and we throw it down with an initial velocity of 12 meters per second. So this has an initial velocity of 12 meters per second down. And we can even write that the flower's initial velocity was zero. Just to specify, I could also write flower initial velocity and ball initial velocity. Okay, what else, what other information have I not put in here? Well, we all obviously have gravity, so we know gravity. That's the same for both of them. But then there's a couple other pieces of information. Specifically this one, it says, at a time of one second later, the flower pot is dropped. And that's also going to be key. But what's it also asking? It wants to know if they're going to meet before it hits the ground. So there's a couple ways we could attack this problem. The first way could be, okay, we can find out, and this is what most students I find doing when they attack this problem from grade 11, is they find the time it takes for the flower pot to hit the ground and the time it takes the ball to hit the ground. And if it takes the ball um, you know, a shorter or longer amount of time, then they can determine, ah, yes, it does pass the flower pot, or no, it doesn't pass the flower pot. And that's great. That will help you answer the question whether or not it passes the flower pot. But there's a trick in this question. It doesn't just want to know whether or not it passes the flower pot. It wants to know where it passes the flower pot. And it says, how far above the ground are the two objects? Okay. 
So let's just make an imaginary line here. And I'm going to erase the ground. Because I don't know where that imaginary line is going to be. But it's going to be in the location where the ball passes the flower pot. Now, our equations can tell us where the ball passes the flower pot. Because the equations are going to simply assume there's no ground. And so this line, where they meet, is what I want to figure out. Where is that line? Where do they meet? Is it above the ground? Is it below the ground? If it's below the ground, then obviously the answer to the question is no, it doesn't, because we know it's going to hit the ground first. And then there's that one piece of information where the flower pot, sorry, the ball is dropped, it was thrown down one second after the uh, flower pot is dropped. How can I write that in an equation? Okay, because you can't go looking on the equation sheet for an equation that specifies that. So let's say it takes a certain amount of time for the flower pot to go from here to this point where they meet. And I'm going to call that delta T F or flower pot. Now, it also takes a certain amount of time for the ball to go from here to here. And I'm going to call that delta T B for the ball. Now, one thing we know is that those two do not equal because the flower pot got a head start, meaning it took the flower pot one more second to travel that distance. So what I can do is I can set them equal, but add one second for the flower pot. So this is an equation. And that's a very, very important equation because it relates one time to another. And there's another equation that we can use to relate these two pieces of information and it's the distances okay now this travels a certain distance to this point i don't know what that distance is i know how far it is from the ground but i don't know how far it travels until it reaches this line where they meet same with the flower pot however if i look at these two distances to the ground i can easily determine that the flower pot traveled an extra 2.5 meters because it started 2.5 meters higher than the ball. So I can write another equation to say, well, the distance the flower pot traveled from here to here, I don't know what that is, but I'm going to label it as a variable delta D for the flower pot. And then the distance the ball travels from there, they are going to label delta D for the ball. Now they're not equal, but I know the distance the flower pot travels is equal to the distance the ball travels plus that additional 2.5 meters. And so I've come up with two equations here. Now what I can do is I can start using our equations of motion. For the flower pot, um, I know the initial velocity is zero, so I can write this as just one half a delta t for the flower pot squared. And for the ball, the initial velocity is not zero, so I have initial velocity of the ball times the time for the ball plus one half a times the time for the ball squared plus that additional 2.5 meters. And now look at our equations. Let's call this equation one, and this equation two. So we have two equations and two unknowns. Two equations, two unknowns. Now it becomes a math problem. Solve the system of equations. Right? You can solve for one here and substitute down here, and then rearrange and solve for the other. Once you know the time it takes for either one of these, you can solve for both. It's a system of two equations with two unknowns. But let's say you know the time it takes the flower pot to go from here to here. Now you can determine the distance. Once you know the distance it travels, now you're going to know where they meet. So let's say the distance it the, takes the flower pot to travel before it meets the, the ball is 40 meters. 
What does that tell us? Well, it's only 28.5 meters from the ground. So if it has to travel 40 meters until they meet, obviously the ball doesn't pass the flower pot before they hit the ground. However, if that distance is 20 meters, well, it'll travel 20 meters before it hits the ground, and so they will meet. And so solving this system of equations will not only tell you whether or not they meet, it'll tell you where they meet. And this is the type of problem solving skills I want you to build. So there's this problem, which I want you to continue on your own. And if you get stuck, watch the, um, the whiteboard animation video that I made. And then there's a worksheet in your package. That worksheet has, I think there's eight problems on it. And those eight problems are all like this one. They're challenging problems. Don't try to do them all in one day. Maybe do one or two a day. Okay, because it's going to take time to build problem solving skills. Okay, but it's like learning to ride a bike. It'll take time, but once you build them, okay, they'll stick with you. And they'll stick with you for anything you apply to. And it's always good to have good problem solving skills. That's why people like physicists and engineers and things like that are always sought after in jobs, not necessarily for the field that they work in, but for any field because they have very good problem solving skills. Okay, so I want you to practice that. And this is also another reason why I told you um, try to keep variables. Right? Don't always try to try and sub in numbers right away because you won't be able to solve an equation right away because we're going to be dealing with systems of equations. Okay, so give it a shot. Uh, let me know how you do. If you have any questions, let me know. We'll work through.